Open Door Baptist podcast features the insightful preaching and teaching of our senior pastor, Jason Murphy. It also comprises of special messages from a number of guest speakers throughout the year. The purpose of this podcast is to be a witness in our community, to encourage others to grow in their relationship with God through the preaching and teaching of His Word, and to serve others in the name of Jesus Christ. Exodus chapter number 35 tonight, and uh, I got to tell you a story as you're turning there. I hate spiders. <laughs> now, I don't, if you like spiders, you're warped, okay? <laughs> there is nothing good. It's just, okay, you know, here we don't have deadly spiders. I get that. Have you seen a spider move, and you think, do you think that's attractive in any way, okay? I mean, the little, you know, the way they move in and of themselves deserves to die, Okay? I mean, they just do it. I just, I have a phobia. I mean, it's to the point of a problem. Um, If I see a spider, if I'm lying, I'm frying, I get my wife and she kills it. Okay? And when we lived in North Carolina, they have, they have roaches, but um, they, they more have like, they're called water bugs, but they look like roaches. Um, and they have it even in a clean house. So I don't want you to think, oh, you had a dirty house, you had roaches. It wasn't like that. Those that have lived in the South know what it's like. And, um, and you know, even those never scared me. You step on them and they pop because they have that hard shell. And, uh, you know, doesn't scare me, doesn't even bother me. One landed on me, I'd go knock it off. But a spider is a whole different ball game. In North Carolina, they have spiders called <clears throat> banana spiders. Uh, at least that's what their nickname. You, okay, you're nodding your head, yeah, brother, okay. I drive my, my mower at my place. Now, these banana spiders are unique in the fact that they don't hide up in the corner of the web, and when bugs or stuff hit the web, they, they boogie on down. These things just permanently are in the middle of their, the web, and they're just like this. And they're just like right in the middle of the web. So no matter, I don't care if you're pushing a mower and you look up and there's a spider web, that thing's coming right at you. Yeah, nasty, huh? So anyway, I, I don't like spiders and it's a known thing, okay? And so after green day or green clean day, whatever it was, Saturday night, I'm getting out to get in the car. It was around a little after five and I had to hurry up to Costco to get some hot chocolate for the class and blah, blah. So I get in my car and my sunroof was closed. And, uh, and it was kind of nice out. And so I go to grab my sunroof and I open it up like this. And a giant spider this big around <laughs> lands right on my shoulder. Now, I won't tell what happened after that because I don't want to get in trouble with you. But I'm telling you, I was a little girl all over again. I mean, I dove out of my car. It was pretty extreme what happened. Uh, Pastor witnessed the whole thing. And what had happened was Mason, who, you know, paybacks are coming. Mason had taken a rubber spider. I take it from the Arnstons or somebody, Dave. And Mason had, you know, put this right up in there, perfect to fall on my, my bean. And so, so, you know, this is why we give him a hard time. Okay? It is, it is justified. Okay? So when you hear us bugging, you know, teasing him because he's short or things like this, <laughs> vertically challenged or, you know, I won't even, but this is justified. Okay, brother? So um, paybacks. All right. Exodus chapter number 35. Just do not do spiders at all. So tonight, I thought what we would do tonight is, um, <clears throat> what we're going to do is take a, a chapter here in Exodus, and the minute I turn to Exodus, probably all my Exodus classes going, really? Didn't we just finish that? Eight months of Exodus is not enough for you, okay? Um, yes, I get that, but we're just going to look at something in here, and we're not going to handle it um, doctrinally or anything like that. We're just going to go through here and just make some application to us tonight, okay? Um, that's my goal. That's my intention. Um, you know, we did uh, yard maintenance on Saturday. Tonight, we'll do some heart maintenance, if that's okay. We'll just do a little heart adjustment tonight, and, and if it doesn't, uh, if your phone doesn't ring, then that's okay, and hopefully you know what I mean by that. The Lord don't ring your number, then that's okay. It was for somebody else. But tonight we're just going to go through here and just make some application to, um, 
to both you personally as a child of God, building a work for the Lord in your personal life, as well as collectively here at Open Door Baptist Church. And so we're kind of tying those things together here tonight, all right? Exodus chapter number 35, and I'm going to kind of, um, <laughs> I'm just kind of, tell you where we're at, okay? And I chuckle because every time I do this, I back up and back up and back up and back up. And you got to have the context. So now I'm in Genesis chapter one and, uh, and it's a great fault of mine. And so I'll try not to do that, but you got to understand where you're at in Exodus here. In Exodus, you're already past God bringing the nation of Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage. And, and in fact, God's already delivered them through the Red Sea. And they saw all those miracles there. And they now, they have come to Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb there. And, and uh, Moses has already gone up to the mount. And he's already been up there 40 days and 40 nights. He's already actually come back down. And they've already had the golden calf issue. Okay, so that sin is already behind them. And uh, Moses then goes back up another 40 days and 40 nights up on the mount. And uh, he, he writes down another tables of stone, as it were, the second, second autographs inspired of God. Okay, so, and, uh, so he comes back down. And, uh, and that's kind of where you're at right now. As he was up there, he did a couple things. He received the law. And he also received information concerning the house of God, the tabernacle. And I know the ladies of faith are, are all over the tabernacle, and, and I, I like their Sunday school room. It's all decorated. I said they should be the example of all Sunday school rooms. It's just, you know, you have no question on what they're teaching in there. It's just great. And so he receives all this information regarding the tabernacle. So in chapter number 35 now, Moses comes down, and he's instructing the people on the building process that needs to take place, okay? So that's kind of um, where you're at here. And so what we're going to do then in, is look at um, two, two, th this building process in two ways. One, building a work for the Lord in your personal life. And so I'm going to kind of hit in those areas. And then as we go through here, I'm going to talk about building a work for the Lord collectively here at Open Door as, as a house of God, if you were, okay? So again, you guys are going to cut me some slack on this. It's not going to be doctrine. It's going to be very practical in nature and very applicable in nature, all right? So um, take a look. Exodus chapter number 35 then. And look at verses 1 through 3. And Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together and said unto them, These are the words which the Lord hath commanded that you should do them. Verse number 2. Six days shall uh, work be done, but on the seventh day there shall, uh, shall be to you a holy day, a Sabbath of, take note of this, of rest to the Lord. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. Now, right off the bat, as you're coming through here, I find it very interesting that the first thing the Lord does, right as he's about beginning the work, uh, all this work of the tabernacle, is he takes three little verses and he talks about the seventh day Sabbath of rest. And just three little verses. Now, this isn't the first time he's mentioned that, of course. Um, by the time you're here in Exodus 35, he's probably mentioned it. I haven't looked at it, Dave. I'm, I'm just shooting in the dark at least five times. But he mentions it here. Now, for the child of God, that is a great, there's a great spiritual truth here. And that is this, that, that any time you're about to do a work for the Lord, a spiritual work for the Lord, the Lord desires that you have a time of rest and spiritual rejuvera rejuvenation. The Lord desires that of you. Um, he desires that you come out and get some rest before the work begins. And, um, uh, you know, he had the seventh day Sabbath. He also had the, the, year, the seven year Sabbath. And so God is not, listen, they just came out of Egypt and God is not a taskmaster. And God understands that this building process is about to take place. And the first thing he does before the work begins is he says, don't forget something. You need to rest. And I'm telling you for the child of God, especially um, those that are big in service, and I'm a big service guy. I believe in service. I believe in rolling up my sleeves and getting busy for the Lord. Um, um, 
But for the child of God that is like that, is bent toward that, you've got to understand there's a time in your spiritual life that you need to come out and rest, especially before a, a work for the Lord begins. Um, I, I, I take uh, twice a year, I go to um, what we call um, Book by the Brook. And so those that, that are, you know, know me know that that's what I do. I take a time where I, I, I go camping and uh, we have a time of just studying the Word of God and just rejuvenating. Uh, during that time, I'll usually prepare Bible classes for the fall semester or whatever the case may be there. But you know what? That's my time. And you know what? Everyone needs that. Uh, if you're here tonight and you're serving for the Lord at any capacity, you know, as well as I know, you're constantly giving to people. You say, well, Kurt, I just have a cleaning ministry. You're giving to people. And uh, you know what you need once in a while? You need a time to separate yourself and get some rest for the work of the Lord. All right? Um, it's very biblical in nature. A time of rest is a time of spiritual strengthening for the inner man. And you have to have that. And, 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 it's, and it's just very interesting. In three verses, in the middle of all this work going on, in fact, chapters 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, all the way up to 40, the very end of the book of Exodus, is all work taking place. And right before all this work is this time of, hey, the Lord says, hey, psh, don't forget to rest. Don't forget to rest. And I would say that the Lord's saying to us, hey, don't forget to rest. And, uh, you know, they say exercise is good for the heart. And it is. But there's a time where you need to also rest is good for the heart. I mean, the heart can't constantly be beating like that constantly. It takes a time of rest as well. So a time of rest usually precedes a time of building. And that's a great spiritual truth found in the word of God. And so you need to take some time to come out and rest a while. And when I say rest, I'm not saying rest from your duties. I just mean this. Listen, your Christian life is a life that's constantly being built upon. God's constantly moving you forward. He is, he is like all good Bible teachers. They're not content with your learning. They're always pushing you to learn more, right? And so the Lord is like that in your spiritual life. He's not content with where you're at. During the missions conference, he's not content where you're at. He wants you to keep moving forward, right? And, um, and, 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 and before that happens, the Lord desires that you have a time of rest before that happens because he's, he's going to be prodding you and moving you forward, all right? And, um, and so that's good. All right, <laughs> look, um, next, look at verse number five. Look at verse number five. It says, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord, whosoever is of a willing heart, let, uh, and let him bring it an offering of the Lord, gold, silver, and he mentions a bunch of stuff down all the way down to verse number five. Jump over to verse 20. Am I going too fast? You guys okay? Someone say okay. Okay, so that's cool. Look at verse number 20. And all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. Verse 21. And they came, everyone whose heart stirred him up, and everyone whom his spirit made him willing. And they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation, and for all his service, and for his holy garments. Verse 22. And they came, both men and women, as many as were willing hearted and brought bracelets and earrings and so forth and so on. So what do I learn from this? I learned this. All offerings are to be given willfully from the heart. Now, okay, let's take it into the context of Exodus. All right, so here's the nation of Israel. They just came out of bondage in Egypt by the whip of a, the taskmaster. They built great cities of Python and Ramses. And they built those. And some of those monuments still stand today. And you know how they were built? They were built by that whip. And so God brings them out, frees them from that taskmaster. And brings them out to the mountain of God. And tells them we're going to build a house for God. And when he does, he doesn't follow suit of the taskmasters in Egypt. That's not your God. Our God says, listen, if there's going to be a building process taking place, you're going to, he's, he's going to desire that you do it willingly of the heart. 
Oh, isn't that always how it is? That's how the Lord desires it. He desires that you just serve him willingly. And um, it's, it's not against, what does that mean, willingly? It's not against your will. It's something that you desire. It comes from that inner prodding of God. Uh, when God gathers the nation together, he does not have them build his house by the whip of the taskmaster, but by the willing heart driven by a holy purpose. And you know what? I'll be honest with you, as silly as this sounds, sometimes when we're building a work here for the Lord and doing something, even as freedom coming up or the, uh, Mary and Wendy over the ladies event, I really feel in my heart of hearts, we're building a work for the Lord. I really do. I think it's of the Lord. I think it's, it's exciting for the Lord. I think it stirs up people for the Lord. And, um, and that's what the Lord desires. This is how we are to give to the Lord's work. It's willingly from the heart. God's giving is to get, be given willingly. That's, uh, that's offering your gifts, your talents, your abilities. And yes, here we go, even your finances. <laughs> you know, we got a special offering coming up for the missions conference. And... And uh, hopefully, um, hopefully you've already been making plans for something like that. You've already been doing some sacrificing along those lines for you and your family and already know in your mind what you're, what you're going to give uh, for those missionaries. None of it goes here. It all goes toward those respective fields that are going to be re uh, uh, represented by the seven missionaries there. But you know what? That's that, that exactly how the Lord deals with this. He just says, I want you to serve me out of a willing heart. You know, my, my, I didn't, when I got saved, I didn't understand a lot of Christian terminologies because, you know, I, I, didn't, I wasn't raised in church. I didn't know what devotions were. I had to go ask somebody what that word means. And, uh, and a lot of things didn't come natural. I had to learn. I had to understand terminologies. And one of, uh, one of those was, what's your life verse? And I didn't even know, what, what are you talking about? What's a, what's a life verse? I don't know what that means. And then someone explained to me, all it is is usually when you get saved or as you're growing up in a Christian home, there's a verse that really speaks to you. And, and, I, and it's interesting because I think that is true. It's just kind of ironic that way. You talk to people and they, all, they, all, they go, yeah, that is kind of interesting how one verse you'll just cling on to. And mine has always been 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. And now I'll probably butcher what it says. But the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge if one died for all, then we're all dead. And we should henceforth not live unto ourselves, but unto him that died for us. And that verse has always just grabbed hold of me. One, because I love serving. And I want to serve. Why? Because the Lord Jesus Christ died for me. And, uh, and I still remember um, my, my past and, and what I did, did against him. And, uh, and it grieves me at times. And I think about the love of Christ, and that is that motivating factor still today. By the grace of God, it is still the motivating factor in all my service for him. And, um, but it's willingly from the heart. What a contrast to the taskmasters of Egypt, isn't it? <laughs> Um, take a look at verse number 21 even. Look at verse 21 in our text, chapter 35, 21. And they came everyone whose heart stirred him up. You notice that? Oh man, if you get a person's heart, you've got everything else. Everything else just, just literally just follows suit. You get the heart. The heart is, the, is, is the, the motivating factor of everything that they'll do. And look at this. Uh, our heart stirred him up and everyone whom his spirit made willing. And they brought the Lord's offering. Notice that the issues there. The heart stirred him up and the spirit made him willing. Made him willing. The Lord desires if you're going to give a work to the Lord and, 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 and give financially even to the works of the Lord, that you do it just willingly. It's not Baptist blackmail, okay? It's not the kind of thing where it's like the preacher gets up and goes, okay, I've got some good news and i got some bad news. The good news is we can pay off the church debt. And everyone sighed, woo, all right. The bad news is it's still in your wallets, okay? Now that is Baptist blackmail, okay? So it's not like that. The Lord doesn't operate that way. And uh, in fact... Um, Turn over to 2 Corinthians. Let's take a look there. Look over at 2 Corinthians. Keep your place in Exodus there because we'll be right back in just a second. 2 Corinthians. <clears throat> chapter number 9. The whole chapter, of course, is on giving. 
And uh, so we'll look at this one, and I think what we'll do is look at one more that I really want to park on. But 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, and verse number 7. Every man according as he hath purposeth in his what? See that? So let him give, not what? Or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. You know what, I must admit, it's a little easy for me in this area. Now, listen, I struggle in other areas. I'll just be honest with you. When my Christian life, when the Lord says, do this, I struggle in some other areas. By the grace of God, the day I got saved, I really never struggled in this area of financial giving. Um, you know, I, I don't know if it was just the way I was brought up. I don't, I don't know what lends itself to that. But, um, but I know many people that struggle in this area of financial giving. And, uh, you know, whether you're rich or whether you're poor, and often if you're poor, um, you go, uh, well, the, um, the rich never struggle with tithing or, or giving to missions or giving. Uh, and I disagree with that. And the Word of God makes that clear. If you are rich in this world, be careful that you trust not in an uncertain riches. They have their own struggles with being financially wealthy. And if you're here this tonight and you find yourself in that position, um, listen, my heart goes out to you. For those of us that are um, below average income in here, I mean, imagine being in an upper income. Imagine where you make, let's say, $40,000 a month. And that sounds like a lot to you. I have a family member that makes that kind of money. Now, can you imagine that family member tithing on that every month? How much is it? Okay, you write that check every month and you tell me if it's a struggle. That's a lot of money. And don't you know the Lord attacks that person just like he attacked, I mean the Lord attacks that person. The devil, the flesh attacks, forgive me father, <laughs> attacks that person just like it would you. It's not any less struggle for that person to give. I mean that's a lot of money. And we all know the more we make, the more we grow into an income, right? <laughs> Take a look at over at Romans with me. Romans chapter number, uh, Romans 8.32 and I want us to look here for just a second. Uh, when the Lord had his house built in Exodus there, the tabernacle's being built, he says, listen, you only come and make an offering if it's of a willing heart. If it's not of a willing heart, I don't want it. And I'm just tying that together today. And the God, God just wants your heart in this issue. He just wants you to do it willingly, not grudgingly, and as a cheerful giver. Uh, Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 32, uh, back up to verse number 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Okay? So <laughs> this verse is just so profound. He that spared not his own son. So God spared not his own son for you and for me. He had his son hung on a tree. And God takes that illustration right there. He says, listen, God didn't even spare his own son. And those of us that have kids in here, let that resonate just for a little bit. God didn't even hold back the thing that most of us would die over. And God didn't do that for you. And then Paul comes along and he finishes off that thought with the end of verse number 32. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things. <laughs> How shall he not really give us all things? You know what? Um, Pastor, uh, go ahead and turn back to Exodus. Pastor made mention of this, but um, um, I'll just confess. I like to be, you know, pretty transparent, pretty honest, not to the point of uncomfortable, <laughs> okay? Some people are too honest, all right? You ever meet people like that? They're like pretty honest, okay? Little kids are like that sometimes, you know, and they'll say some pretty embarrassing red-faced things because they're kids and they don't have that discernment. But I like to be pretty truthful in my walk with the Lord with other people to just as a way to encourage them. And um, during the missions conference last year, okay, so I was sitting right over here about where this empty pew is, and um, um, and uh, I had some money that I had sold some things, so I had some cash in my pocket, okay? And I won't tell you how much, um, but I had some, some money. Now, guys that are married, if we have money that even my wife didn't know about, okay, those come far and few between, okay? 
And I'm thinking, oh, I got this money, man, you know, and I'm excited. And uh, well, Wendy didn't know about it, and I could spend it on whatever I wanted, you know. I could eat the burgers that I shouldn't eat. I could, I could do whatever I want with this money. And I'm sitting there, and God is my witness. And I told Pastor this. I said, Pastor, I, I mean this with all my heart, that um, the Lord laid it on my heart to um, give that, to, to get it out of my wallet. And I sat in that pew and argued with the Lord. I did. I'm God is my witness. I said, no, this is just, this is just, I'm being guilted into this. This is not the Holy Spirit. Okay. And this is just because, you know, we're in the right setting and the right mood and, and, and I'm just being prodded. And the Lord as sure, it was almost an audible voice. Now I don't think I heard an audible voice. That's not what I'm saying. But if you were to ask me to this day, I would say, listen, the Lord looked at me and said, Kurt, I've, you've never had a problem in this area. Are you going to start now? God is my witness. I wept over there because it, it, it crushed me. And he's right. The Lord's right. By the grace of God, I've never had struggled in that area. Uh, what's, if it's the Lord's money, give the Lord's money. Uh, if there's an offering, make plans, give to the work of the Lord. And the Lord said, Kurt, I'm telling you, you better watch it. And I said, Whew. and I ripped that wallet out so quick. I got it. I got it out of my wallet. It's the Lord's money. I don't want nothing to do with that. You know why? Because listen to me, my relationship with the Lord is worth way more than that measly little green stuff in my wallet. And I'm not talking marijuana. I know this in the Northwest. Okay. <laughs> All right. Willingly from the heart. You see, that, that, that's all that is. It's just that willing, willingness to just that sensitive spirit of God prodding you to do what's right and prodding you to grow in areas. And that's what the Lord does here in Exodus. He says, if you're going to bring an offering, bring it willingly of the heart. All right, second, or thirdly here, all those who, uh, all those who built... Do not have all those that build, excuse me, do not have the same position. Look at um, look at Exodus 35, and again, we're just kind of visiting through here, but look at verse number 10. And every so he separates two groups of people here. He separates the uh, the willing heart, that's in verse number um, five. He separates it to verse number 10, the wise in heart. You see that, the wise hearted? You guys see the difference there? And what he's doing there is when God gifted individuals, he took these individuals of the willing heart and they were to offer everything. They offered, for instance, all the materials needed to put together a tabernacle. They would offer the, uh, the goat skins and they would offer the stones for the bre high priest breastplate. Uh, they would offer the, the linen to sew together all the fabrics for the curtains. They would offer the gold and silver and brass for all the fittings of the tabernacle. And then you have this other group in verse 10, God calls the wise hearted. Now the wise hearted ones were the ones that once the stuff was brought to them, they were the ones God gifted with knowledge in constructing those pieces, turning material into the garments, turning just lumber and brass and silver and gold into ringlets and, and, and other parts of the tabernacle. They were the ones crafting it, okay? And so what do I get out of this? Listen, for the work of the Lord to be done, there has to be different gifts in one body of people. And, 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 and that is the beauty of the work of the Lord, and, and that is um, necessary for the work of the Lord to get done. In the building of the tabernacle, what if those that were supposed to bring the, the material didn't bring it? And the, the craftsmen are over here going, hey, we, I, I'm willing to craft, but they haven't brought anything. Or what if they bring everything and it's just a, a lump of material and the ones that are called to craft it into the priest's garments decided, hey, I'm not going to do it. But see, everyone has to, has to know their purpose within the group. And, and that's how the work of the Lord can still continue. I'm going to read a verse here in Romans. It says, for, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. Now listen, the world gets that. Military gets that. But sometimes there's a great disconnect when it comes to the church, the body of Christ. 
Now listen, I, you know, I, I consider myself a good employee. <laughs> I can, I, 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 by the grace of God, I can wear three different hats. Um, pastor is my pastor. Pastor is my boss. And pastor is my friend. Now those are three hats that are hard to wear at times. But by the grace of God, I understand positions. <laughs> And I can separate when I'm in the office and my boss is telling me to do something. You know what I do? What do you want me to do? Yes, sir. <laughs> it's no problems, right? And when I'm sitting out here and he's preaching, he's no longer my boss. He is my preacher. And I'm listening to the word of God and listening to him expound on the word of God. And I'm asking the Lord to move within me and make decisions accordingly and ask the Lord to speak to my, I'm just like you. And then when we're out fishing, <laughs> Then he's my friend, okay? And we can just cut up. And I never take advantage of our times when we're friends. And I never use that time when he's cutting up to, to sit in a pew and look at him and go, oh, yeah, I was just with you. I know how you really are. I don't do that. That ain't the right thing to do. I don't do that. I don't hold. Listen, he needs to just relax and just cut up too. How's that sound? <laughs> Amen? All right. All those who build do not have the same position. Uh, look, uh, so you got verse number 10 there. And continue over to uh, uh, chapter number 36. And um, verse number 1. Then wrought uh, Bezaz Bezazlil, that's a nice name, and whoever else, and every wise-hearted man in whom the Lord put wisdom understanding to know how to work all manner of work of the service of the sanctuary according to all that the Lord had commanded them. Okay, and so what's this? The Lord has two special people and they were the overseers and they saw how it all go down. And so what is that? That, that is the idea of, listen, in a church, there is just leadership and that, and that leadership is there to take you and mold you and, and craft you over time as you yield to the Spirit of God so that you continue to use your gifts and abilities for the Lord. That's what the leadership is there to do. And when you submit to that, you come out the other end molded and crafted and fit for the master's use. What happens if you push against it? Well, you know who ends up doing that? Miriam, Moses' sister, and Aaron. Moses' brother. They go to him and they say this, and they said, Had the Lord indeed spoken by Moses, hath he not spoken also by us? And you know what the rest of that verse in Numbers says? And the Lord heard it. Mm. <laughs> and of course, you know the story. They get in trouble from the Lord. But you know what? They, they looked at Moses and um, they looked at him and they saw his inabilities. Listen to me. They saw his inabilities and they perceived they had a high estimation of their own abilities. And that can cause a problem. Anytime there's a problem in, 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 in leadership, it's somebody who has an overestimation of themselves and an underestimation of what God is doing. Now listen, all the leadership here, you guys know, we have inabilities, okay. And I mean that, I'm not being humble, but the Lord for somehow still uses it. I mean, I don't understand it for the life of me. But what happens in a church oftentimes, and in the Corinthian church is a perfect example of this, this backbiting and covetousness and, and, and people and seeking positions and being in the limelight and whatnot and what, what for. Uh, you know, even this, this area up here, and pastor knows me more than anyone, and um, maybe that's why the Lord keeps putting me up here once in a while, is because this is the last position I feel like I belong in. And I'm not saying that to be humble. I'm saying that because you, you guys, anybody do public speaking? Yeah. How, how did it go for you? A little nervous? <laughs> okay. All right. You understand what I'm saying? All right. But the Lord's gracious along those lines. All right. Um, 
leadership in the church. Enough, enough there, enough said there. <clears throat> Let's take a look at another point here. And we got a few more minutes here. We'll just knock out a couple more, maybe skip a couple. Again, we're just kind of moseying through the book here. Look all the way over it to um, Exodus chapter number 39. So in between Exodus 35, 36, you've got all this building taking place. Um, Exodus chapter number 39 and verse number 42. All offerings are to be brought to a specific place for a specific purpose. All offerings. What do I mean by that? Now, I'm not only talking financial, though I am talking financial, but I am also talking about your gifts and your abilities. Listen, the local church is where you use those things for the Lord. Amen. And verse number 42 then, it says, According to all that, he, the, um, that the Lord commanded Moses, so the children of Israel made all the work. Verse 43, And Moses did look upon all the work, and behold, they had done it as the Lord had commanded. Even so had they done it, and Moses blessed them. You know what they did? They brought everything, they crafted everything, and they brought it to a place. And I'm just saying that that's a great spiritual truth. And it is this, that your gifts and your abilities are to be brought to a specific place for a specific purpose. And I submit to you, it's the local church. I submit to you that that's where you're to use your gifts and your abilities for the Lord. Uh, I've met a lot of people that have a take it or leave it mentality when it comes to church. And, and that's their prerogative. But the fruit of that mentality is going to be bore out in their children and their children's children. Right. It will. They have a take it or leave it mentality when it comes to church. Sometimes I'll come, sometimes I'll not come. I just, they have a low estimation of it. They don't get involved in it. Now, you guys don't. It's Sunday night. So I'm talking to people that aren't here, okay? But I mean that. It's a problem. And... Uh, and uh, I, I would ask this, um, how are they, people that have that estimation to take it or leave it with church mentality, um, how, are their, um, how are their children's prayer lives? You ever walk by their bedroom at night and see if they're bowed on knee? I'm just asking. How is their knowledge of Bible or spiritual things if you have a take it or leave it mentality of church? Uh, how is their witness for the Lord? How is their service for the Lord? You know what? I, I know who, uh, you know, you guys all know this. There's a home, a home church mentality out there. Okay, I'm not telling you nothing new. Uh, we believe in a home church. Uh, the, 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 the big church mentality separates families. Oh, okay. The home church. Okay, yeah. Uh, where do you serve the Lord? Right. Oh, in my garden. Oh, okay. <laughs> in my driveway when I wash my cars. Oh, okay. Uh, where do you tithe? <laughs> Seriously. I mean, barf. I, I'm sorry, but barf. I mean, the local church, man, I'm a big lo church, local church guy. Um, if, you, if you put a low estimation on church, it, it will, you will suffer the consequences in your children and your children's children. Right. And they will follow suit of that. Right. And where you're barely coming, they will discontinue that altogether. They'll, they'll see your face and they'll understand and they'll have a low estimation of church. Listen, church is where uh, your gifts are sharpened for the Lord. Gifts are where, uh, church is where you get to use all your gifts and your abilities for the Lord. Um, all right, so enough of that. Um, let's move on. <clears throat> and lastly, how's that sound? Everyone likes that word. <laughs> Uh, when the hearts of God's people get involved, blessings follow. Turn all the way over now to chapter number 40 at the very end of 40. Now we're at the end of the book of Exodus here. The tabernacle is built and now it's erected. And, um, and then, of course, some things happen here. So when we talk about the heart of God's people getting involved, blessings follow. Um, and I'm talking about blessings. Sometime you should just, if you can, just rewind the clock from when you first started coming to Open Door Baptist Church to where you are now, and I guarantee you, you'll see something different in your spiritual life. You will. You know, when I, when I came back from North Carolina, I came here, um, you know, eight, eight, nine years ago, whenever it was, I, I see the difference in my, my kids. I do. And I, and I thank the Lord Jesus Christ for teachers over there teaching them. And I don't think it separates my family. <laughs> you know what? Sometimes your kids don't want, don't want you telling them what to do all the time. Sometimes it's good to have Diane Stoltz to tell them what to do. 
<laughs> and I mean that, Diane. I want them to learn Bible from you guys. Amen. I want them to learn from you. I want them to serve with Mason in the Green Thumb Ministry. I want them to learn some things about serving in a local church. And they don't have to always learn it from mom and dad. And that's a good thing. I like what Dave Havman said when he talks about that certain group who, who you know, the, the dad is the pastor in the home church. And he's like, listen, don't do that to your kids. You're boring. <laughs> and I like that. I thought that's pretty good. So he said it, not me. So don't, you know, okay. All right. <clears throat> Listen, when the hearts of God's people get involved, blessings follow. Look at verse number 33 here. Um, <clears throat> and he reared up the court, uh, court round about the tabernacle on the altar and set up the hangings of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. Verse 34. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And of course, uh, they get to see the, the blessings of the Lord here. The Lord has ordained that he, his will be accomplished by his people from all the saints down through the ages. This is your calling and this is our calling. That when we serve the Lord with our life, we get to see the blessings of the Lord. We get to see the Lord's work get accomplished. We get to see people get saved. We get to see lives changed. And that is all the fruit that you get to see. And oftentimes that fruit, you only get to see it after a long season. And, you know, hindsight's always 2020. And when you're in the midst of it, and, and you, I told Pastor the other day, and I, now, let's see, is this too truthful? Hmm, let me think about this. <laughs> I told Pastor the other day, I said, you know what? Last Sunday night, I was at home, I was tired, and I said, man, I did not feel like coming to church. Now, by the grace of God, I can tell you without lying, that's probably happened about 12 times in nine years. That's not bad. You say, you feel like that? Do you? <laughs> I ate a really big meal, Okay. Do you know what it's like when you eat a really big meal and you've been serving all day? Okay, I'm just telling you, you feel like this. Vroom. Okay, and I felt like, and, 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 but I tell you what, all the way from, back from Pastor Blue days when I would sit up there after I just got saved and I was living in Lake Stevens, didn't want to come on a Sunday night, I came anyway. The Lord blessed through that message. And it was the one message I said, and I, so last Sunday night, I looked over at Wendy, and she's here. She, she, she would tell you if I'm lying. I said, every time I say I don't feel like coming is the time, when, and I come anyway, is the time the Lord spoke to me the most. And I appreciated that message last Sunday night. And the Lord spoke to me. And I said, here we are. I told my nudge my wife. I said, see, every time. It's the weirdest thing. I'm going to start not coming. I mean, desire to not come every Sunday night. <laughs> I'm teasing. I, I wouldn't do that, but... All right, I think that's good tonight. Listen, here in Exodus here, it just, it lends itself to just a lot of practical truths for the child of God. And, and uh, ultimately tonight, that was just my only purpose is to just to pull out some of that, make note of just a few things that we could uh, adjust our hearts in the work of the Lord. Um, you know, someone just said, you know, Open Door Baptist Church, they put everyone to work. <laughs> oh, man. You know, um, um, Jonathan, are you here? Jonathan Gordon here? Jonathan? No. His dad, when he was coming here, uh, he, he uh, ends up, went to another church now, and he's, he's, he's over there with his mother or grandmother. I forget how it works. But anyway, he's down there, and he came back for one of our things, right? And I look over, and he's ushering. <laughs> I said, brother, what's going on? He goes, man, you can't walk in this door without getting put to work. <laughs> I like that. I say, yeah, that's good, man. Are you kidding me? That's good. You're using your gifts and talents. That's the way it should be. Amen. So anyway, tonight, I just want to try and, and encourage you to always guard your heart when it comes to the work of the Lord. Missions conference coming up. You're going to be tired. There's going to be many a night we're going to say, I just don't feel like coming. But I'm warning you, or I'm, I'm exhorting you, that if you come anyway, that'll be the blessing. That'll be the message you needed. And that's how that thing works. All right, let's bow in a word of prayer.